Let's do it. <laughs> Hello, gamers. Welcome to the E3 Coliseum. I am Jeff Keeley, the inaugural E3 Coliseum. We are here at E3, uh, where it all starts for gaming. And this is a special moment for all of us, because this is the first year that consumers, the real fans, are here at E3. You guys excited? Well, this is going to be a really special couple of days. We've got two days of panels. All the biggest game creators will be here live on stage, and we'll be streaming it around the world. Uh, we're excited, and we're going to get right started now with our first panel. Uh, really excited about this one, uh, the team from Sony Santa Monica Studio. They showed a little bit of it last night. We're going to hear more about it. Uh, let's get to God of War Behind the Curtain. Enjoy the show.
Joke is still up. All right, and ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host for God of War Behind the Curtain, Michelle Morrow. Michelle? Hey guys, what's going on? All right, well, first of all, I think we should thank Joe Castillo for that incredible performance. So please help me in giving him a warm round of applause. All right, well, I want to first start by welcoming all of you guys to the God of War Behind the Curtain panel. Most of you guys know why you're here, obviously, but I'm a huge fan of this series, so I was really, really just overwhelmed by the fact that they asked me uh, to moderate this. So without further ado, there's a lot of questions because we saw a really cool world serpent come up last night in the trailer. So let's bring out the team from Santa Monica Studio and get a little bit more. Guys, wanna come on out? Let's give them a round of applause. introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Shannon Scottsdale. Um, I was one of the original founders of Santa Monica Studio back in 2000, and um, I spent many years with the studio, and now I'm heading up the crew and uh, head of studio. Uh, hey, everyone. <laughs> Shannon. Uh, I'm G. Troff. I'm the gameplay engineering lead on the project. Uh, I primarily work with the gameplay, animation, design, and tech teams in realizing sort of the vision of that crazy man over there, as well as sort of bringing the gameplay and narrative experiences uh, to life in the game. Hi everyone, I'm Ariel Angelotti. Um, I'm on the art side of things. I'm a producer for the uh, concept art team, the character art team, and the character tech art teams, as well as uh, dabbling in some other aspects of the art. Hello everyone, I'm Corey Barlog. Uh, I'm the director of the game and I make their lives completely miserable uh, on a daily basis. Uh, that's really it, that's the best description. <laughs> Get to it because we have a lot of questions going on. Um, you know, this is a big reimagining of God of War. So I think my first question really would be for Shannon, being the studio head. Um, you guys were, I guess the fairest way to say it is at, at a crossroads a couple years ago for the studio. So when you were looking forward, did you envision God of War to be a part of that future? You know, a lot of people felt like God of War needed to rest and breathe um, after the release of Ascension. And uh, I, I was pretty strongly, um, you know, my gut knew that there was so much more that we could tell in terms of story and character arc with Kratos. We've seen one dimension of him. Um, and, you know, as we were kind of at that crossroads, it was really apparent to me that we needed to really look for a new beginning and someone that could tell that new beginning in a way that, um, are you causing Sorry, problems? Sorry, I was arranging the furniture. Jesus. Go on, um, you were saying. So, um, <laughs> in my mind, there were two people that could retell this story and really pivot the franchise where, you know, the, the fan base um, would, you know, it would be a compelling experience. Uh, one of those people is Dave Jaffe, the father of the franchise. Um, He was uh, pretty busy at the time, so uh, the second person that immediately came to mind, and I was still in contact with Corey, for me as a, as a producer um, at heart, even though I'm studio head, I still love the production process. You keep in touch with creatives, and um, you never let them go, and when, when they're a true visionary, um, we call always that looking stalking. at... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was before you got married. Um, so... <laughs> So good, good, is there good, a story good conversation. There? <laughs> Not at all. I was like buried with two kids. So um, we had a good lunch, and um, it, I, I saw the new Corey because we hadn't seen each other for a while, and he was he had been around the world working with different creatives, and uh, he really uh, resonated with me. I walked away from that lunch feeling 
sort of, you know, and that you, you feel it. You just yeah. walk away going, this is going to work. This is going to happen. Especially and with somebody who's been a part of the franchise since yeah. the very beginning, right? So, like, for you, Corey, did you know what you wanted to do when you are coming back? I know you've talked a lot about fatherhood and the inspiration of that, but when you were first, you know, consulted, did, did that immediately come to mind, this new direction? Uh, I think the first thing that came to mind is I, I knew that if I wanted to jump into something that was probably going to be, like, five years of my life, uh, it had to mean something, you know? I think what I learned when I was working with so many people in the, the time between was, you know, finding your own personal way into everything that you do. You know, that every story that you tell, everything that you, you make, you have to have some kind of personal connection to it, some kind of truth that comes from your own life, right? So I don't think it was the first thought, but I, it definitely was, as I started circling around ideas, the one that kept resonating more and more, uh, that I actually felt like, it's, it's something that had a little weight to it. Yeah. A little life. Yeah, and, wh and, and then why Norse? Why did you go into that direction? Uh, well, we looked at a lot of mythologies, actually. Uh, Norse is the one that sort of uh, rose to the top, but there was a top three, I think, uh, and our team was about 11 or 12 when we were choosing the mythologies, and a lot of very fierce debate. There was camps on either side of this, and I ended up just making the final decision, kind of looking out to where I wanted to see the franchise go uh, many games into the future, and kind of how we were going to grow it, and I realized, like, I think the best place to start is Norse, you know, yeah. that it had such an incredibly rich mythology, uh, and it, it was so vastly different, I think, than what we had done before. And I think I've heard you talk before about how it's just kind of in the areas, right, like each kind of area within uh, had their own religions and whatnot. So Greek was part of it, so he just took a boat yeah. over to Norway or yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, mythologies are, are, are sort of creation stories of each culture, right? Mm -hmm. And cultures are essentially separated by geography, right? right. So there are creation stories that they date back. So there are mythologies happening around the world at all times throughout history all the way back. So the, we are sort of positing this concept that, that at all times there are various gods walking the earth in each of these different mythologies. So we get, to, we get to the Norse mythology, we get to an older Kratos with a son. Shannon, did this worry you at all? Because Kratos is kind of known as like our beloved, committed to anger, maniacal anger bot. So how did you, how did you react to that? I love that description. <laughs> anger box. A, a child abuse fear or something along those lines. Yeah. You know, I think production is, I mean, it, there's risks everywhere. And, um, you know, my, my time with the team has always been asking questions, um, poking at issues that I think could be controversial or maybe not taken well, uh, but trust. You know, I, I've, I've got to trust in the team and know that if, if they, as an, or, or Corey as an individual visionary, if he feels really strongly about something, he's going to be able to push that. If it doesn't really work for the franchise, he's going to listen to his team. And even though, um, there's tons of passion. There's a lot of very in strong individuals on the team. He has to um, be able to be steadfast in that. Yeah. And if it doesn't necessarily kind of work itself at the team level, uh, I know that it's going to find its way in playtests. Because playtests are so, um, you know, deep into the fabric of the way that we build games. We yeah. listen to the players, right? So that's the last stop that I think everyone relies on, and certainly arbiter. Corey. Yeah, they end a lot of arguments. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. How about how, for G and Ariel being a part of the team? How did you guys approach this, and how did you feel about the new direction? I mean, I think for me and and for the team, um, sort of going in this this new reimagining of Kratos and and the world. I mean, to some degree, it's very bold, very challenging, and and honestly, a little bit terrifying, uh, in the sense that you know when you're going from a sequel. You've got your foundation sorted, you've got your mechanics sorted, and you're building on something solid, right? You're going from, from something tried and tested and moving on to the next step. When you're going for new IP, you've got sort of a clean slate to some degree, right? Imagine whatever you want. When you're going for what we're doing right now, which is sort of this reimagination, um, you have something that's familiar, and you have something that fans really care about and players really care about, and we want to sort of maintain that but we still want to flip everything, break it apart, yeah. and then start putting it back together slowly, right? So for us, that in itself um, was, you know, to some degree terrifying, but also <laughs> really rewarding 
in the way that we've changed everything from the combat to the mechanics to including the sun to the environment to everything is, is different, new, and fresh. And scary. And scary. Uh, but I think, um, you know, it is a little bit, the way I look at it is, it, it is for us to be able to carve out sort of our own little space in the action adventure, close combat melee genre, and define something that includes exploration, includes progression, includes sort of the, you know, the sun and companionship and, and really give players something different. Yeah, absolutely. Ariel, how about you? Yeah. I mean, even on the art side, it, this presents a new challenge. We're in an entirely different land than we were in the previous games. There is a, a new mythology. Um, specifically for this game, you wanted to go for a pre-Viking era uh, with the art direction, but what does that look like? Uh, you know, we, we'd established, um, uh, you know, tapping into the Greek mythology that, well, how is it that we make something look Greek? Well, you know, you put, put, a, put, put a column in it, <laughs> but put like a nice... Like, that is really what we term. did. Like, like a, it doesn't look Greek term. enough. Put a column in it. <laughs> is that like a red color? It's like uh, it worked every time. Yeah, um, but, but what does that look like for, for our game um, when there were actually so few surviving artifacts yeah. uh, from the era that this game is taking place? So on, on one level, that's extremely restrictive. Like, what? how do we make the game look Norse? Uh, but on another hand, it gives us a certain degree of creative freedom um, yeah. uh, to establish what that language is. And um, uh, I mean, one of the things we sort of, <laughs> uh, in the concept art team, we sort of developed a little tagline that like, well, how do we make something look Norse? Put a rune on it. Put a rune on <laughs> it. Put, that, put a rune on yeah, it. That's put right. Put a rune on put it. A rune uh, on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the interesting thing about using runes um, is that it not only gives it a, a Norse feel, but there are opportunities for world building and yeah. character building in it. That you know, you might see some characters with tattoos. Uh, you know, building into like figuring yeah. out what those tattoos are going to be saying is sort of giving some background behind a character or uh, you know, a, a piece of architecture. It's incredible how much research goes into uh, making a game just in general. And I heard that you guys actually took a Nordic trip. Is that right? Yes. Did, how many of you guys from the team went? It was me. You did? Yes. Yeah, I was it was just <laughs> From, from nice. the panel here. Um, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was awesome. I uh, spent about a month there. No. Um, we had about six of us. Uh, environment artists, rendering engineers. We really wanted to do a cross-discipline wow. look at, uh, and it's just a beautiful landscape there, and so diverse. It was amazing how much we were able to pull from in terms of the uh, just the uh, landscape visuals. Every every almost half a mile, you're seeing something completely different. So we had a lot of uh, reference material that we were able to bring back, um, and we were looking at the architecture of some of the older. Um, construction there and the boats and so forth, because a lot of that history is uh, still something that they celebrate. So it was, uh, it was a fun trip. And to be able to get it right, you know, to be able to yeah. come back and say, this is what it would look like, and you guys reimagine yeah. it in your world. I still, <laughs> I am no art director, but I still walk the floor and say, hey, this looks like uh, an area that we saw um, in Iceland, and I'll pull out the, the pictures and John Palomarczyk looks at him and says, okay, I'm going to start to introduce some of this stuff into, uh, into the, the levels that he's working right. on. Yeah. Well, that really works into a lot of like, I don't know, like the critical decisions that you guys have to make as a studio in general. Um, and, you know, one of those critical decisions I think um, that I want to ask about is, Corey, did you ever in this process consider having a different protagonist other than Kratos? Because I know it was something that was talked about a lot online. Mm -hmm. The Kratos is who we all love. Did you ever consider it? Uh, I tried to consider everything, uh, but I think I kind of always came back to the concept that, to me, Kratos is fairly intrinsically God of War. Uh, but even more so, there's a still a story there. You know, I think when I was, again, uh, perhaps uncreatively connecting things back to my own life, uh, I realized that that when I made the the first and second game, I was a very different person than I am today. Uh, I'm a bigger asshole today than I was then. Uh, growth, people. It's fantastic. Uh, it's brilliant. Uh, so I, I kind of was looking at the, the first eight games of 
God of War, uh, because I never want to forget the mobile game uh, in that eight, uh, and, and realize that you know the, the Greek era is kind of this fantastically long introduction to a character, this sort of origin story for somebody that, that has a place to go. I mean, the, to me, the most interesting story is like uh, in, in Iron Man 1, right? To me, fantastic movie, because you get to see sort of Tony Stark, billionaire playboy, selling weapons, uh, and really not connecting or caring about any of that stuff, and going through the process uh, that he goes, the growth, the arc that he goes through to become what he becomes at the end of that. Spoilers, if anybody doesn't know that he's Iron Man. Uh, <laughs> But watch the movie, come on. Uh, so I, I think to me that's very interesting. And then to be able to take a character like Kratos back from where he was, right? He's in a fucking dark place, man, really dark. But I think that's what's so interesting. I think all of us go through a lot of ups and downs in our lives, right? That, that nobody's life is just that. It's boring, right? Nobody goes through that. It's all over the place. And I think to be able to take somebody from the extreme to another extreme, I think is, to me, why I consume content. You know, that's drama. That's, that's exciting. So I think that challenge almost immediately when I kind of realized that, like, this is the challenge I want to take on, right? Yeah. And stay with Kratos and, you know, and add, and add in a, a sidekick, which it looks like we can control at some points. So I'm not exactly sure. So, uh, it's interesting. It's, it's not like a, a direct control in the sense you're going to be ordering him around to... To, to do things. He kind of is this fantastically sort of autonomous partner who we have dedicated a specific button to so that you are like a father sort of teaching him, commanding him to do things, but he, like a, an individual, will do some of the things on his own as well. So that's kind of the interesting dynamics of, uh, of sort of parenting as well as kind of dealing with uh, another character in the game. But I know a lot of people are concerned thinking that he will be a burden. I even heard it on some of the reaction videos last night because I love those things. Uh, and, and when the, the son jumps off of one of the enemies and fires the, the bow, uh, one of the guys said, oh, good, so he's not going to be a burden. And I was like, success. That, that was what the trailer was supposed to do. <laughs> he is absolutely not going to be a burden. Uh, he, he is 100% an accompaniment to Kratos. Oh. And uh, you know, when you have a character who doesn't talk that much, you have a character who lives a lot of an internal life, you need somebody who is going to speak a little bit more to allow the conversation to continue flowing, right? Yeah. So that it doesn't just become fairly one-sided uh, rage. So I think, it's, I think it's fantastic. Jeet, what was it like for you to be able to deal with the sun? I mean, the, the sun, to, to Corey's point as well, is, is so paramount to the story and, and sort of this bond between father and son as being a core pillar of the game. Um, when we took on that challenge, I think we didn't, we didn't want it to just be limited to the narrative, right? We wanted to, to bleed that sort of dynamics and that, that combination or that, that bond all the way into every aspect of gameplay as well. So, you know, be it puzzles, be it um, combat, obviously. And, I mean, our game is, we're so mechanics heavy that, like, every, I mean, every day there's a, there's a fight about, like, hey, where, where should I put this? You know, which button can I map this to? We're constantly fighting about buttons. <laughs> and, and the fact that we've dedicated a button to the sun is a sort of testament and commitment to, you know, what we want the sun to be in this game. It's the share button. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, I think taking that challenge on was, was tricky. I mean, I think even a while, uh, right in early development, we had a lot of our sister studios sort of, you know, come down, give us some feedback, sort of to some degree caution us about the challenge that we were about to take on. Um, and I mean, you know, there's so many instances of, of the son, um, you know, getting stuck behind something or not following him, or, you know, following the player correctly or, and, and, you know, over time, it's just getting better and better and better. And we've seen him sort of grow along with our development along with all of us in these last couple of years as we've been working on it. And you know, just, just recently we had, I don't know, a couple, maybe a month or two ago, we had uh, a situation in the game where uh, he was separated uh, by a gate between you know, the player on one side and the son on the other side. And everybody was like, yeah, okay, you know, he's just gonna get stuck now. And someone had added a feature where he found a little hole through the gate, crawled through that space, came out on the other side, turned and faced the player and was like, 
what, Dad? Look, I made it through, you know? And, and just watching that for us, while it's pretty insignificant from a player perspective as you watch it, I mean, that was like, oh my God, or, you know, like our, our little boy, he's growing up. Like, <laughs> he's, he's making it, you know? He's, and, and so, all in all, what, what that does, at least, I think, is, is really like double down on this idea of the journey and the adventure, yeah. you know, of, of father and son through, through everything, through combat, narrative, mechanics. Uh, and it's, it's been, I mean, the team has done an, an amazing job in bringing, bringing him to life. And, and you know, we're, it's going to be, it's going to be great. Well, I'm, I'm excited, excited to learn more about him, like who his mom is and all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I think one of the oh, most, not gonna he's like, it's not, I'm not telling you. It's fine if I didn't ask, I'd be in trouble. But when you play the game, you'll find out. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I think since we're on the subject of him, we were talking about it backstage a little bit. Do you guys want to talk about his hair? Oh, <laughs> oh. yeah. That was fantastic. All right. So for a long time, uh, we didn't have our, our hair technology. Right? So the son was bald. Uh, and he looked just like Kratos. And at first we were like, whatever, let's just put like it in. He didn't look like Kratos. He looked like he was sick. He looked like he was sick. So he... <laughs> and you say you're not an art director, but you're art directing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there was an ongoing battle between her and I. Every time I'd see her in the hallway, she'd be like, put some hair on that kid. Come on. He's looking really sick. Uh, and so being the person I am, I actually did want hair on him, but then I started switching to the opposite side of the argument. I'm like, he is staying bald the whole time now. Uh, this is what we have to deal with every day, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tend to troll people. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, so so for, for a long time, it basically is stuck at that. And uh, uh, Raph Grissetti is our character artist, lead character artist, and he He's the guy handling all the hair. He did the glorious beard on Kratos uh, and did the skulls of Kratos. It's just phenomenal. And he had told me, oh, I'm going to put the hair on the kid. Uh, so I told him to go Corey to Shannon. Corey doesn't know I was in the background of the raft discussion. I found my way. She's the one that set it up. See, I was trying to give her a win as well Back by channel. saying, you know, Raph, tell, tell her that you didn't tell me. Tell her <laughs> that you did it, and I'm just going to be really upset about it. But yeah, it's, it's really nice. It ended up turning out very, very good. Well, I'm uh, glad that Hairgate has been settled. Hairgate, so. well done. <laughs> Took months. But, gee, you brought up something kind of, kind of interesting where you said sister studios came by and sort of, you know, gave you advice or warned against or whatnot. And so for Shannon, you know, having the, uh, the cameras, the no cut, like the entire time, did anybody warn you against that or was that something you were looking? Um, I think I was personally more concerned about Sun at the time. Um, there's just so much work and Jeet and team have done a phenomenal job um, you know, watching him grow. Um, Our little boys all grown up. Camera He's was, grown up. Camera was a, a, a topic of discussion for quite some time, and this was another yes. one where Corey, in my opinion, I, I'm not sure if this is necessarily true, but he really stood alone on this one. Uh, I don't think very many people wanted to go down this path, didn't really understand the value of it, um, and he he pushed, and I think we're we're much better for it. We... For a long time, it seemed like just a crazy idea that I was pushing. Uh, it really does have a strong purpose. I think it's interesting to actually be able to play uh, as Kratos without ever looking away. The idea of camera cuts, I think they're fantastic. They're they're sort of a, a vocabulary for film that mm. are almost invisible to us when we watch something great, some great TV, great film. It's just we don't see it. But I think for video games, we have this opportunity to never look away, to actually exist as the individual character throughout the entire experience. Somebody want to get that? I like how it's like a regular phone ring, too. Right. It's just like, ring, ring. I think it might be my mom. <laughs> Tell her I'll call her back. No, but it's a massive undertaking to do that, to yeah. just go it's full yes. it's on camera huge. the entire time. See, I think before last E3, the, the technical director had, had sat me down and said, you probably shouldn't tell everybody that we're going to do no camera cuts just in case. And I was like, just in case what? We've committed to this. We're doing this. Right He's like, after that, you just yeah. yeah, and I was like, tweet. that's like the worst thing you could tell no me cuts. because now I'm telling everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get a t-shirt that says no camera cuts. <laughs> he failed social engineering that day. <laughs> Well, I want to, I want, I mean, we don't have tons of time left. We have about 16 minutes, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about the casting process um, because we have a new Kratos. We also have a young boy. Um, so I wanted to ask you about what that was like to cast those characters because he's 
really young, like nine or so nine when you guys started? Old. When we cast him, he was nine years old. Um, I was advised or, or strongly cautioned that, you know, it's the film adage of never work with animals or kids. Uh, which should be a game development adage, considering how difficult it is to get the son to do anything in the game. Uh, but everybody said, oh no, it, it's going to be a hard, uh, and, and I was kind of pushing for the, the concept of it's the only way you're going to get the real performance, is to have both actors on the set during the shoots and actually have it be a kid, right? And I mean, it's, it's even proven in when we watch some of the footage, we have a, a stunt person and uh, the kids, so when we do any sort of crazy complex stuff like throw them off a building or something like that, we have to get a stunt person in because apparently that's a no-no for kids. Uh, I don't know. We're going to change the laws. Uh, so you can absolutely tell even the way the stunt person stands, even the way the stunt person walks. You know, oh, wow, that's, that's not the kid. That's not really the kid. It makes a massive difference on sort of the legitimacy of the performance. And it took a long time to find Kratos because, you know, you have to find a very large person, right? Very large. Uh, and we were very, very lucky to get Christopher Judge, an incredible oh, performer. He's such a good actor. He is unbelievable. <laughs> he brought a, a, an incredible amount of intensity to this. And The Sun was actually uh, the, the first part that we cast. So we went through a lot of different meetings. And this kid's audition was just phenomenal. Uh, he's like 30, nine going on 30, just super <laughs> mature, very on point. Uh, it was, it was, we were very lucky to get him. What's his name? Sonny Sulik. Sonny Sulik. Yeah. He was actually just at Cannes, hanging out with Nicole Kidman and Colin Farrell, so he's not going to return my calls anymore. <laughs> he's, he's famous now. And you said when you started this, he was nine, but now he's about 14 or so, or how old? 13? 13, I think. 12? I don't 12? really know. Yeah. <laughs> he's still well, nine I, in my mind. I think we actually have a clip of it. Um, we totally do. Aaron, have it. do we have a clip that we could show everybody? Maybe? I always wanted to try this out if it would work. Oh, here it goes. Ah. Why'd you say nothing? So this is that oh. scene from the trailer. Oh, yeah, this is from the actual trailer. You think I'm weak right. because I'm not like you. I know I was never what you wanted. But after all this, I thought maybe things were different. You do not know everything, boy. No, but at least I know the truth now. The truth? The truth. Why did you wait so long to tell me? I had hoped to spare you. You are welcome to surprise me. talk at all about that process were you there the entire time during the mocap shooting yeah 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 so that's a it's a an amazing process there's so much preparation that goes into it from the cinematics team shooting uh animatics kind of getting everything dialed in i mean i was very very fortunate to have a really incredible crew so that every time when we went in for shoot days it was running like clockwork like absolutely no no issues and we're doing you know single shots that sometimes uh, are four minutes long. So I was an idiot who had no idea what I was getting into when I said, well, no camera cuts. Uh, and then the reality of actually going on set and shooting four minutes with, say, five actors, mm -hmm. and you have to get five actors' performances perfect in one take. Uh, so a lot of free work went into making sure that every single thing was dialed in. Uh, Dory Arazzi is the, the camera guy, the cinematographer, and he is just amazing. Uh, we have this little uh, VCAM thing, right? It's basically like a little la uh, or tablet that uh, is getting video of the, the, the cameras that are in 3D. And he carries that thing around, and it's like shooting with a Steadicam. Uh, but every once in a while, all the controls will reverse. So all of a sudden, up is down, down is up, left is right, right is left. But you'd never know, 
this guy's so freaking good that on the fly, he just completely just reverses everything that he's doing so that he doesn't ruin any of the takes. So we're like in three minutes of a four minute scene and he does that and goes, oh yeah, my camera got messed up. But you absolutely rewatch it, you're like, I never had any idea. So <laughs> it helps to work with absolutely great people. I am surrounded by people that are so much better than me. Uh, and, and that I think is the only, well, it's actually pretty easy to surround yourself with people that are better than you. Uh, but I mean, these guys, it's, Absolutely astounding. I, I think, uh, my, I, I, I'm so thankful every single day that they're the ones that have to do the hard work. And that <laughs> scene was just amazing. How much rehearsal did you have for these scenes? Uh, we would do rehearsal days, like two rehearsal days before the shoots, but then we'd also have Sonny come in, uh, because in the game, we use a lot of uh, the original Norse language. So anything you actually can read written on all the walls is something. It means something. We've written it and it's placed there for a very specific reason. Uh, but also throughout the game, they will speak in the various languages. The sun, uh, which is kind of a reflection of my own life again, uh, is kind of the translator for him, right? So Kratos is this stranger in a strange land. Uh, my wife is Swedish and uh, I don't speak any Swedish. Shameful, right? When it, I mean, her parents are in town right now and I am just the worst. I can say like, you know, hot dog and drink. <laughs> I'm like a trained monkey in Sweden. Uh, but yeah, uh, and the, the son is a lot like that because my son, five years old and is speaking Swedish, right? Wow. And, and basically he speak English and Swedish and it's just pointing at me and laughing that I'm so dumb. <laughs> uh, but it's that same dynamic of like, Kratos can't understand anything these people are saying, but the son is always able to kind of give that conduit. The son kind of like the player is the conduit in. So it's really cool. Well, you guys, I mean, there's a lot of new people on this project too. You've got Sunny. Um, you've got new Kratos, you've also got uh, Christopher, and you also have a new composer as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Talk about working with great people. Uh, Bear McCreary, I don't know if anybody's familiar with his work. <laughs> yes, let's clap for that one. A little show called The Walking Dead. Uh, little show. Battlestar Galactica, I don't know. Yeah. My kid is actually named after a character from Battlestar Galactica. Really? So, yeah, Hilo. That's uh, awesome. My favorite, our favorite character, while, while she was pregnant, uh, that was our favorite character on the show, so ended up doing that, and everybody's completely confused by the name when we tell it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I didn't think we were going to get him, like, they had suggested it, and then we had a meeting, and I was just like a ball of nervous energy, just trying to pitch the project and make it seem exciting, and he was like, m you know, matching me for nervous enthusiasm. He was just so excited and so, like, on point with everything that we were talking about, uh, and ever since we committed, and we committed with a high five. That's how we did it. It was the nerdiest moment in my life. I was just like, we're walking around the studio, and I'm like, I finally couldn't take it. I was like, so, so what's up? Are we going to do this or what? Which is super subtle. Uh, <laughs> right? And, and, and he's like, yeah, man, I want to do this. I was like, and I was like, right as I did it, I was like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Why are you high fiving this man? And, and, Right away, without hesitation, he high-fived me back, so I was like, all right, we're both dorks, it's fine. <laughs> oh, wow. Shannon, for you, as the studio head, uh, having all these new people, new experiences, and, and trusting Corey and all of this, I mean, as far as personal growth with the studio, how do you feel about how everything is right now? You know, right now, very, very pleased. It's, it's been tough. It's been tough the last, you know, few years, pivoting this franchise, pivoting... Uh, we actually moved into a new facility. Um, we had to grow this team uh, like I've never seen before. The recruiting process on this has been a monster. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's never easy balancing all these personalities and all this talent. Um, everybody has a very clear um, goal for how good they want this game. And um, you know, we bump in together every once in a while. Sure. But it's, it's all for the good of the ultimate goal of uh, greatness and quality. And uh, it's uh, at a point now where I think we can all see it. And I think that's one of the things that really happened to our benefit early on is Corey was able to really get not only the team behind uh, the story and the, and the pivot that he would be making with Kratos, but the whole organization, PlayStation. Yeah. Um, we had multiple meetings where he got up and pitched the game and um, there was no questions, you know, a lot of times you spend this kind of money, you get executives a little more inquisitive on why you're making certain yeah. decisions and so forth, and he was really able to nail it. So that gave us a lot of foundation, a lot of freedom, which PlayStation's so good about, 
um, allowing us to breathe through this very challenging time. Yeah. Um, so we're in a good position right now. We just got to close the game out and um, all the hard work's on the team. <laughs> I know. Do you guys have any final thoughts? Because I do have like two Facebook questions or so, and I would like to get to those. But I'd like to have even if you guys have any final thoughts on the game. Uh, I, I think uh, we as a studio have uh, something built into our DNA, our culture, that uh, just inevitably we find ourselves making like really terrifying decisions and going off in really terrifying directions. I mean, just talking about the sun and how like the technical challenges that, that are entailed in making that decision. Yeah. Um, going in a brand new direction with a new mythology. It's a right decision, but it's terrifying. And I mean, as, as a producer, uh, I find myself sometimes terrified at the decisions that we're making. But we're a big decision. Yeah, yeah uh, of course. but I think it's a, a credit to, to the team, just talented artists, programmers, uh, uh, everyone pulling uh, in a direction uh, of, of greatness that um, I just, I just want to give a shout out to everyone on the team and their hard work and dedication. So, uh, I mean, you, you saw that trailer. That took so much effort and talent, and and people are are putting in 120 percent to to get things you know ready for everybody to see. And and it's just I I continually find myself inspired by uh, everyone that I work with. I think it's also people by saying, oh, don't worry about it. Yeah, <laughs> it never is. It never is. Yeah. I think it's the mm -hmm. perseverance, too, that really th th this group is so, you know, focused on taking those baby steps forward. And that's the only way you get through these big risks. And, um, you know, doing that in a united fashion, we're just going to get stronger and stronger through this process and um, continuing to make you guys happy. All right, well, um, I do have a couple questions. One is from uh, Joseph. Uh, I'm going to say his last name. I know I'm going to butcher it. It's Hamchawi. Hamchow? He says, uh, this is for Corey specifically. It says, the new game is about Kratos teaching his son not to make the same mistakes he made. Hypothetical scenario. Present day Corey is talking to the Corey that directed God of War 2. What does he say? Also, second question. How has the process different making the game than making God of War 2 for you personally? First, present day Corey would say to old Corey, you're awesome. Uh, <laughs> old Corey would say thank you, because uh, I was much nicer back then. Um, I think I would say uh, you need to introduce Gaia as the narrator more because nobody's going to get it. It's going to feel out of left field. Don't fuck that up. Um, that, I, I would say that to me, that, that one, oh, and then the, the last sister navigation puzzle thing. I think every one of us who directs one of these games has our, our sort of uh, terrible, terrible choice. Uh, and I, I don't know if I can speak for Dave, but I think we've had many conversations about this, the vertical blade poles in Hades. Yeah, those were pretty rough. Uh, <laughs> And I think that one uh, in, in God of War 2, the, the weird Sister 3 uh, navigation puzzle, that was just ill-conceived. I think we could have done a lot better on that one. Uh, but the process has changed tremendously. Uh, we have uh, teams that are three times the size now. So trying to get that many people to agree on something, it's like just get three people together and ask them where you want to go to dinner. <laughs> right? That's never going to work. Uh, this is, you know, 270 people all agreeing on a creative concept. Uh, yeah. It's very difficult. It is a constant management of expectations and keeping people in the loop. Did it break? <laughs> all right, good. Uh, <laughs> see, I, I care about people. Okay. <laughs> he does. He does. Or at least their phones. Uh, so, yeah, I... I, I it's interesting, in the beginning of the, the, the game, I did a pitch to the whole team on the story, but I didn't have the story figured out. We hadn't really figured it out, and we needed to do some things to get everybody to understand sort of structurally what the game was. So we kind of just slotted a bunch of stuff in. Uh, who knows, and if we have a behind the scenes, you might see this, but it's like some really like 
hand wavy crap at the end of the game that was just like, and then we'll do this. And everyone's way more savvy to realize, oh, he hasn't really thought about that that much. So that's definitely very different than we had to do it before. Yeah. Um, I do have another question here. It's a little, um, we'll see. We'll see if you guys can answer it or not. Uh, it's the same person, Joseph, and he's asking, also, does the world serpent betray Kratos and Arteus as he is the son of Loki and Loki is the god of mischief? That's what this person is asking. Everyone's and it's going to just be all like dead silence. Yeah. <laughs> Wall of silence, people. Wall Sorry, of silence. Sorry, Joseph. Uh, yeah, that's the only one uh, from, from Joseph. So no, no answer on that one, unfortunately. You're going to have to play the game, Joseph. Um, does anybody in uh, the audience have any questions for the team? Everyone's just like, hmm. Right on. All right. Right up here. Shows up. Oh shit! Thanks. Um, <laughs> my question was: Are you going to see more Norse gods? Because um, I know with uh, all the God, God of War games, you, you always saw like a different type of god, Zeus and all of them. Will we see Thor, uh, Loki, things along that nature? Gods are, are, are a fairly important aspect of this mythology and this this world. Uh, specifically, whom and when uh, you have to play. I'm sorry, that's a sucky answer, I know, but... <laughs> it, it actually really wasn't, because there's some fact, because everyone knows God Award, you're going to see gods, but with a lot of aspects of Norse mythology, they were just, no one ever actually saw them, so it's just like, it was a, just the thought of them, so... That is a really great point. Uh, I don't know if everybody heard that, but not a lot of... Uh, in, in, in sort of the Viking era, they always talked about how the gods had, had abandoned them, right? The gods were these, these sort of figures that had lived before them. Right? And, and prior to the Viking era is the migration, when Europeans moved north to Scandinavia and all those areas. Uh, and prior to that, the pre-migration is this period of time that we are taking place in the game. I am positing, we are positing, that that is the time when the monsters and the gods and the giants all kind of walk the earth. That's when Midgard was kind of this sort of middle ground between all the different realms. So it gives us a tremendous amount of freedom, so maybe they will be appearing, who knows. Maybe. Again, crappy answer, I know. I think we have time for one more, and I believe it was right there. So what I'd like to know is, what was it like uh, when you were thinking about the new weapon, uh, going from the Blades of Chaos to the Axe of Destruction? Calling it the Axe of Destruction, I don't care. I'm sorry. <laughs> what was yep. that? Did you call it the Axe of Suction? No, 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 the Axe of Destruction. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Acts of destruction is much better than act of, acts of suction. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a very good right, microphone. We, we have type for that. We have, right. Uh, uh, the weapon uh, was, yeah, very, very controversial in the beginning just because we really wanted to kind of uh, rip everything apart and, and rebuild it from scratch and kind of see what really is necessary, what is not. And, uh, you know, the, the combat team. Uh, is, is incredible. You know, I have uh, an incredible team of designers, very creative, crazy people, uh, whom I fight with on a regular basis. Uh, and the, the sort of genesis of this was years in the making. I mean, this was definitely not flip a switch and it was all good. The kernel of the idea was definitely early on, uh, but it took a long time, I think, to kind of find, we're still finding it, to be honest. I mean, games are, are essentially, you know, making those final tweaks uh, as it's coming off the lot. I mean, it really is all the way until the end. Well, and for, this one? For a long time, there was, there was the idea of not even throwing the ax, yeah. right? So, you know, that, that addition in itself is sort of this, this amazing, memorable um, thing that you, you get to do every single time and it never gets old in the game. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know. What made, what, like, forced the decision to throw the ax? Like, what was the uh, impetus for Vincent making Vincent Napoli. Yeah, he had this cool idea, and uh, he had talked about it for a little bit, and I think he really just needed to put it in the game, put it in the game and, and, and did it, and I think everybody was like, oh, this is really cool, this is the beginning of something. Him and uh, uh, George Mall is the, the programmer, uh, and they both just kind of worked a little overtime and, and cranked this thing out as sort of a proof of concept, and it was just awesome. Uh, so much so that every review leading up to even E3 last year, I was annoying people to no end because I would throw the axe at everything in the world 
Like in all the reviews, I'd just be like, Phoom, and it would just be my way of testing to see if there was any collision. So it'd be like, go through a tree, go through a rock. I'd be like, yep, no collision there. They're like, dude, stop that. <laughs> They're like, we don't like throwing the ax now because you're ruining it for us. But I, I, I still, to this day, what's that? What's that? Give the microphone. No, I was saying, can we get a uh, evil cherry tree boss? You know, <laughs> just so we can throw the axe there. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, and it's now going in the game. <laughs> but good try, you guys. Thank you so much for the questions, and I just want to thank Corey, Ariel, G, and Shannon for joining us today on the God of War behind the curtain panel. Um, we gotta go to E3 2017. Have a great time. Wrap it up.